practice for a military parade to mark the 70th anniversary of China's victory in the resistance war against Japan's aggression and the world's victory in the Second World War is underway in a Beijing suburb. Except for the parades held on National Day, it will be the first state-level military parade since the founding of the People's Republic of China. Never before did a war like World War II bring such dire catastrophe to mankind. Never before did a war ever receive as much scrutiny and remembrance on such a global level as World War II. Chung 2014 their joint efforts and the loss of countless lives, mankind's dignity was kept and world peace was restored. China's resistance war was an important part of the Second World War. China was the starting point. It saw the longest period of fighting and annihilated more Japanese troops than anywhere in the world. The Chinese nation made the biggest sacrifice and was a major flashpoint of the Eastern theater. Mao Zedong said, the rise of the Chinese nation made China an inseparable part of the worldwide resistance. Our enemy is also the enemy of the world and China's resistance against Japan is of global significance. To US President Franklin Roosevelt, the only way to defeat Japan was through China. Roosevelt said, without China, Japan can storm to the Middle East for a pincer attack, to meet Germany, to separate Russia and swallow Egypt it can cut our transportation routes to the Mediterranean. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill thought likewise. He said that if the Japanese army appeared in the Indian Ocean, all the ground the Allied forces had held in the Middle East would be gone, and the only way to prevent that was to keep China. Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union agreed. In his words, only when the hands of the Japanese invaders are tied can we avoid fighting on both ends when Germany comes for us. The Chinese war of resistance against Japan marked the Chinese nation's first victory over foreign invaders in modern history. It was a brilliant chapter in the history of the Chinese national liberation movement and World War II. 
After 70 years, it remains in the memory of millions and is still highly significant. May peace last and justice prevail forever. In 1931, the world was astounded by the September the 18th incident. Japan unleashed its Kwantung army on the Chinese army's north camp after bombing a portion of the Nanman Railway and accusing the Chinese army of doing it. The incident was part of Japan's plan to justify its occupation of northeast China before moving to occupy the whole country. It was a decisive step in Japan's expansionism, the start of China's national resistance and the prelude to the Second World War. World War I officially ended on November the 11th, 1918, and was followed by the five-month-long Paris Peace Conference, attended by representatives of all victorious nations. Together with representatives from Germany, they signed the Treaty of Versailles. China was also present at the conference. But China's request to bring an end to the privileges that the big powers enjoyed in its territory fell on deaf ears. The United States, Britain, and France resisted China's opposition and agreed to transfer all the privileges that Germany had had in Shandong province to Japan. The Chinese nation was furious. Without any real power or unity, the idea that justice prevails remained a dream. It was no wonder that French Marshal Ferdinand Foch said, no, this is not peace, just a 20 year long truce. Even before the smoke of World War I had settled, the foundations for World War II were already in place. Dissatisfied with their share of the spoils after Versailles, confrontations between imperialist powers grew heated. The 1929 Great Depression then rattled these nations even further. Italy, Japan, and defeated Germany found themselves on a common path towards the evil that was fascism. It was a road of no return. Fascism featured racism, despotic dictatorships, colonial expansion, and aggressive wars. Italy, Germany, and Japan made up a tide of destructive fascism, threatening world peace. The breakout of the next world war was just a matter of time.
Japan in the East turned out to be the most aggressive of the Axis powers, a role Japan was destined to take. The radical reforms conducted in Japan after the 1868 Meiji Restoration changed the country completely. Its age-old Bushido tradition, a lack of natural resources and sharp contrast with Western colonial powers conspired to lead Japan to aggressive militarism. Its eyes were on the resources and lands of neighboring countries. Japan's expansionist policy from 1890 was heavily influenced by former Prime Minister Yamagata Arimoto, who felt that the Japanese government had to do more to protect its line of interests. So where was the boundary for this line of interests? For Yamagata, it was in Korea, and the route from there to the continent was crucial to transportation to India via China. Japan was not content with being a naval power. It dreamed of being an empire spanning continents. Conquering China was key to its continental policy. Japan's plan for expansion was accepted and finalized. Japan's first step was to take Taiwan, then Korea, Northeast China and Mongolia, followed by the whole of China and finally, Asia. Prime Minister Tanaka announced his notorious Tanaka Memorial at the Oriental Conference in Tokyo on June the 27th, 1927, to detail his strategy. To conquer China, we must take Manchuria and Mongolia first, and to take the world, we have to do China first. Taking China's northeast was the first step in Japan's plan. Beyond the Shanghai Pass and on the other end of the Liaoxi passageway was the rich and fertile Sanjiang Plain China's greatest source of food. Old maps show railways extended from Harbin in all directions in the northeast. With a low population in a vast area, China's northeast was economically a rich place. Between 1904 and 1905, Japan took over Lushun, Dalian, and the Nanman Railway from Russia. That allowed Japan to freely loot the natural resources in China's northeast. Top quality coal and iron ore were shipped to Japan night and day. By 1931, over 200,000 Japanese immigrants were in China's northeast.
Manchuria was really the focus of uh, Japan's interests from uh, the from 1905 uh, right up uh, through uh, the 1930s, and the Japanese felt that's where they were going to uh, be able to uh, develop uh, heavy industries and benefit from the uh, plentiful agricultural land uh, for to uh, move some of their uh, farm farmers there and develop Japanese industries. The Kwantung Army, a notorious pawn in Japan's arsenal, was sent to guard the Nanman Railway. Seshiro Itagaki, a senior staff officer in the Kwantung Army, was at the forefront of planning. Seshiro was a fanatical fascist, like many in Japan's military. They shared the same objective, separate Northeast China and make it a colonial country in Japan's control. They even formulated a plan that had Japanese of dual nationality as the backbone to run large commercial businesses, Koreans in agriculture and Chinese doing manual jobs. The Northeast was no longer China's. It was there for the taking any time Japan wanted. The Kwantung Army chose September the 18th, 1931, as the day to strike. Via its strategy of accusing China of crimes it had itself committed, Japan proceeded to take the whole Northeast China. The structure of peace set up after World War I collapsed, and the war in the East began. The Japanese came from the west to the Chinese army's northern camp, killing anybody they saw. Some Chinese soldiers lay on the ground playing dead. Some jumped out of windows, and others hid under beds. Over 300 were killed by Japanese machine guns. Chinese resistance was already in motion. Part of the Chinese 7th Brigade stationed in the North Camp fought its way out. All of the Kwantung troops were called to action that night. Cities along the Nanman Railway fell overnight, including Shenyang, Changchun, Andong, Benxi, Fushun, and Yingkou. When the incident happened, the Chinese army received a non-resistance order. Prior to the incident, Chiang Kai-shek instructed Zhang Xueliang via telegraph not to resist regardless of what the Japanese army does in the Northeast. Conflicts should be avoided. Zhang Xueliang was urged to put national interests first by bottling his anger. Following a strategy to resist foreign aggression only after the country was domestically stabilized, Chiang Kai-shek was busy fighting the Communist Party in the South. The third day after the September the 18th incident, the CPC, Communist Party of China publicized a statement to denounce the Japanese invasion and the KMT, Kuomintang, government's non-resistance policy. Following the statement came more announcements from the CPC's Central Committee and the temporary central government of the Chinese Soviet Republic of China to denounce Japan's aggression. They called on people to rise and fight the Japanese invaders. The Jiangqiao Bridge on the Nunjiang River was the prize on the road to Qitihar, capital of Heilongjiang province. Over 1,300 Japanese troops assembled on November the 4th. Ma Jianshan, acting chairman of the province, led his forces in an effort to stop the Japanese advance. The Japanese army, having many casualties, received repeated reinforcements. 
After two weeks of resistance and many casualties, the Chinese army withdrew. They killed 167 and wounded 600 Japanese troops. The battle was the first grave setback for the Japanese army after the September 18th incident. After taking Shenyang, the Japanese army bombed Jinzhou, a city close to the Shanghai Pass. It was the first non-discriminate bombing of civilians conducted after World War I. In just four months and 18 days, the whole Northeast fell, leaving its 30 million people in miserable circumstances. To cover up its aggression and confuse international opinion, in March of 1932, Japan founded Manchu Kuo, a puppet regime in China's northeast. The fight for national salvation spread across China like wildfire. Armed resistance began with the Northeast Army of Volunteers a force spontaneously formed by local people. The CPC and its Northeast Anti-Japan United Army soon became the backbone of resistance. The temporary central government of the Soviet Republic of China declared war on Japan on April the 15th, 1932. Seven months later, in a letter to all CPC departments in Manchuria, the CPC called for unity between all anti-Japan forces. It sent a large number of CPC members to the Northeast to mobilize people to fight. Among them were heroes and heroines such as Yang Jingyu, Zhao Shangzhi, Zhou Baozhong, Li Jiaolian, Zhao Yiman, and Leng Yun, they were the founders of the Northeast Anti-Japan United Army. Yang Jingyu's 3,000 men were the largest force in South Manchuria. To the Japanese, Yang Jingyu in the south and Zhao Shangzhi in the north were their biggest threats. Besieged by over 20,000 troops in the autumn of 1939 during an advance against the Japanese, Yang Jingyu and his men fought to the last after running out of ammunition and food. What had sustained this general in icy and snowy conditions for over 40 days? An autopsy on Yang Jingyu's body revealed there was no food in his stomach except for undigested herb roots, tree barks, and cotton fiber. Not even a single grain of corn was found. A Japanese army officer involved in the hunt for Yang Jingyu wrote the following. This war against China may not work out. With soldiers like Yang Jingyu, China won't be conquered. Zhao Yiman was another anti-Japan heroine. She was sent by the CPC to the Northeast as political commissar of the 2nd Regiment of the Anti-Japan United Army, but was captured in November 1935. Before she was executed, she left a heart-rending note to her son. 
Your mother's life is coming to an end because of my resistance struggle. I have nothing else to say for your education, just what I have done. Hope you bear in mind your mother's death for the country. By 1937, the Northeastern Anti-Japan United Army was a force of 30,000, covering 70 counties in total. As the major unit to fight the Japanese invaders, it conducted thousands of battles in extremely difficult circumstances and annihilated over 10,000 Japanese troops in what was a huge boost for China's national salvation. Shanghai, the gateway to China's Yangtze River, is the largest industrial and commercial city in China. Back in the 1930s, it was the fifth largest city in the world, with a population of over three million. As with its invasion of the Northeast China, Japan once again shocked the world with its attack on Shanghai on January the 28th, 1932. The attack was a planned action to divert the world's attention from its occupation of China's northeast and the puppet Manchu Kuo regime. The January 28th incident was also meant to turn Shanghai into a base for actions in the Yangtze River areas. The 19th Chinese Army, headed by Jiang Guangnai and Tai Tingkai, rose up to fight it beat back Japanese troops trying to enter the city at different points. On the 29th of January, it took back the transportation hubs taken by Japanese troops. Factory workers organized by the CPC were very active in supporting the Chinese army. They took to the streets for anti-Japan parades and organized support for transportation, communication and medical help. Some were even seen on the front line. At the Jabe railway station, Several foreign reporters saw Japanese troops kill Chinese civilians. Their stories covered the front pages in the US. The Chicago Daily News and the New York Sun ran headlines such as Bloodshed in Shanghai. This was the last stand, the last barricade of the Chinese forces of the 19th Route Army that opposed the advance of the Japanese Marines through these roads. During a month-long battle, the Chinese army repelled three Japanese attacks. The Japanese army had to change its commander three times and cried for reinforcements. When Zhang Zhizhong and his 5th army came to reinforce the Chinese 19th army in Shanghai, morale was greatly boosted. Zhu Yaozhang, battalion commander from the 19th army, wrote a poem about the battles in Shanghai, the last one of his life. We fought for freedom. We fought for survival. Our enemy is strong and cruel. The weeds along the river are gone and our tears are no more. We breathe with difficulty. Our sentiment has long gone, replaced by the resolution to kill enemies. We want our land back, even at the price of our lives. He took seven bullets before he died. With more and more Japanese troops arriving and attacking both sides, the Chinese army, with no reinforcements in sight, was unable to hold any longer. They withdrew, and Shanghai fell on March the 2nd. Three days later, the Songhu Truce Agreement was signed.
Back in the north, the Japanese army didn't stop after taking the northeast. It looked to take every city and town along the Great Wall. Beiping and Tianjin were in danger. Battles broke out along the Great Wall in March 1933. This is the famous broadsword march composed by 23-year-old musician Mai Xin to eulogize the dare-to-die broadsword team of the Chinese 29th Army, which had left Japanese troops terror-stricken. Chop their heads off with our broadswords, its lyrics went. Armed brothers across the country, this is the day we fight to the death. Five hundred team members headed by brigade commander Zhao Dongyu snuck into a Japanese camp at night to conduct close-range combat, killing many Japanese troops. It was a battle to rebuild the nation's confidence. A Japanese newspaper called it a shame we haven't seen in the past 60 years. And there was more to come. At the Great Wall's Gubei Kou Pass. Japanese troops finally took control after meeting fierce resistance. They found seven dead Chinese soldiers. These seven men had cost the Japanese several hundred lives. At the foot of the Great Wall, Japanese troops erected a stone with seven Chinese warriors to show their respect. The Tanggu Agreement allowed eastern Hebei province to become a demilitarized zone under Japanese control. The nature of the Nanjing government's policy, conceding to the Japanese and suppressing anti-Japan activities, was as broad as daylight. But the Japanese army didn't stop, as they advanced to eastern Chahar province. Patriotic army generals like Feng Yuxiang, Feng Zhenwu, and Ji Hongchang joined hands in the form of the Chahar Mass Anti-Japanese Allied Army. Through bloody battles, they recovered lost lands. This was the first time the Chinese army had taken back land from Japanese hands after the September the 18th incident. But the KMT government tried all it could to halt Chinese resistance. Ji Hongchang, commander of the 2nd Army, was arrested and killed in Beiping. Ji had worked his way up from foot soldier to army commander. He joined the CPC in 1932. The poem he wrote before his execution is known by millions of people. What a shame to die this way, not on a battleground by fighting Japs. When the country was being blooded, they took no pity on my life. Japan's constant aggression inspired other fascist nations in the West. Germany and Italy continuously pushed Britain and France to the limits of their patience. In a speech delivered on November the 1st in Milan, Benito Mussolini described the relationship between Rome and Berlin not as a barrier, but an axis. He said other European countries should gather around this axis in cooperation. This is how the name the Axis countries came about. With Italy as an ally in Europe, Hitler needed one in the East to contain the Soviet Union as well as allies of Britain and the US. This ally in the East would make another wing of the fascist alliance. 
This ally was Japan. Backed by the Japanese military in March 1936, Japan had a new cabinet and a new prime minister, Koki Hirota. Hirota established a fascist constitution incorporating the Japanese emperor and the army headquarters. In August, Japan began to advance north towards the Soviet Union and south to Southeast Asia. In November 1937, Germany, Italy and Japan signed the anti comintern Pact in Rome. This pact marked the formation of the fascist Axis countries. Gathering clouds heralded an oncoming storm. In both the East and West, fascist forces developed rapidly. The next world war was imminent. The North China incident staged by Japan in 1935 was meant to separate the northern part of China into a second Manchu Kuo. The fate of the Chinese nation was in the balance. What was next was the question all Chinese were asking. The CPC was even more concerned. The CPC, in the name of the Chinese National Armed Defense Committee, published the Basic Military Program for the War of Chinese Resistance Against Japan, followed by the founding of Chinese Workers and Peasants Red Army Going North to Resist Japan. In November 1934, on their way north, the troops were outnumbered and ambushed by KMT troops. Feng Zhimian, their commander, was captured in jail, he wrote, Lovely China, a poem that remains famous today. We will fight to the last when someone tries to destroy our nation, a nation of 4,000 years history and a population of 400 million. No matter what happens, we won't let our beloved country go or suffer in the imperialists' hands. On August the 6th, 1935, 36-year-old Fang Zhimian was killed in Nanchang. Beginning in October 1934, the Red Army began the Long March, a strategic transfer from the south to the north. During the Long March, they announced the CPC's policies for national salvation by resisting Japan. In August 1935, the CPC released its famous August the First Declaration. It called upon different political parties and armed forces to make national salvation the priority. In Red Star Over China, American writer Edgar Snow wrote the following. The CPC people firmly believe they are marching to the front line to resist the Japanese. Mao Zedong described the setting up of revolutionary headquarters in China's northwest as gaining a foothold after the Long March, a starting point for the war against Japan. 6,000 college and middle school students led by the CPC Beiping Temporary Working Committee took to the streets on December the 9th, 1935. It was China's most important mass movement in the name of national salvation. Down with Japanese imperialism, stop the civil war and unite to fight the Japanese invaders was some of the slogans shouted by marchers. This movement's significance was huge. To Mao Zedong, it was a national movement for unity, mentally preparing the people for a war against Japan. It was also a chance for anti-Japan cadres 
to emerge. In December 1935, the CPC Central Committee held a conference in Waiyaobu in northern Shanxi. The conference denounced leftist closed-door policies within the party. It also formulated the CPC's policy for the anti-Japan National United Front. The conference laid down the political and ideological foundations for the coming war against Japan. In July 1936, American reporter Edgar Snow and medical doctor George Hatem were impressed by the dynamic Red Army. Over the next four months, they met with Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, Peng De Huai, and other Red Army generals. Mao described to Edgar Snow what the CPC was doing, working to establish an extensive National United Front to fight Japan. The front would involve many political parties, social groups and military forces for national liberation. Gathering in this anti-Japan united front, influential people from all walks of life, even from the Kuomintang, stood up to call on the KMT government to change its policy of non-resistance. Song Qingling founded the National Self-Salvation Association and the China National Armed Self-Protection Committee. She was the honorary chairperson of the World Anti-Imperialism War Committee. Famous people like Shen Junru, Zhou Taofan, and Shi Liang publicly offered their support. The Shanghai Salvation League for All Walks of Life called upon the Nanjing government to stop civil war and resist foreign invaders. They were promptly arrested by KMT police and thereafter known by the general public as the Seven Noble Characters. In November 1936, news came that Fu Zhuoyi's 35th Chinese army won three successive victories in the battlefields of Suiyuan. Mao Zedong and Zhu De sent their congratulations to Fu, describing him as a man that honored the Chinese nation and army. The CPC's policy for a national anti-Japan united front won nationwide support. Because of this, the Kuomintang became split internally. Chiang Kai-shek traveled to Xi'an in October 1936 to try to convince generals Jiang Xueliang and Yang Hucheng to join him in attacking the CPC's Shanxi and Gansu anti-Japanese bases. Influenced by the anti-Japanese National United Front initiated by the CPC, the two generals, in turn, tried to talk Chiang Kai-shek around. Failing, they held Chiang in detention. Chiang, they said, should stop his policy of fighting the CPC and instead join forces to fight the Japanese invaders. Known as the Xi'an Incident, Chiang's arrest in December 1936 shocked the world. In a public statement, Zhang and Yang announced their eight proposals for national salvation. In a telegraph they sent to the Central Committee of the CPC in North Shanxi, they invited representatives to come talk. After assessing the situation, the CPC decided to go ahead. Zhou Enlai was sent to negotiate with the Nanjing government. He worked hard for a peaceful solution to the incident, and his efforts paid off. 
Chiang Kai-shek gave his word that he would put an end to the anti-CPC policy and join hands with the Red Army in fighting the Japanese. After agreeing terms, he was escorted back to Nanjing by Jiang Xueliang. The peaceful solution to the Xi'an incident became a turning point in China's war of resistance against Japan. It marked an end to years of civil war and the beginning of national unity. At last, the ten-year civil war ended, giving way to national peace. The CPC and Kuomintang began to cooperate for the second time to jointly resist Japan. Looking back to the 1920s and 30s, fascist Germany, Italy and Japan began aggressively expanding. Countries and regions fell victim, one after another, to their aggression. Second World War only became a world war for different people at different times. The Americans will always see, the Asia Pacific will always see 1941 as the starting point, I think, um, and the British will always see perhaps 1939 as the starting point. In Britain and in America, we recognize the contribution that the Chinese made in resisting the Japanese um, to a certain extent, obviously from 1931. China experienced much after the September the 18th incident. Humiliation from loss of territory, grief from terrible destruction, and courage to face these horrors alone. Through it all, China never stopped fighting. Facing the powerful and deceitful Japanese fascists, different political forces rallied under the banner of an anti-Japan National United Front initiated by the CPC. The end of civil war united the nation and prepared it to meet the Japanese fascists on the eastern battlefields. Yeah. 